Hello, everyone. Welcome to our YouTube live stream. Just so everybody knows, it is being recorded and it is being live streamed. So if you don't want to be seen, just turn off your camera. It's perfectly fine. Um, welcome to part three of our kayak fishing webinar series. Today, we're going to cover how to fish from a kayak. And I think we have found an excellent guest to teach us all we could ever want to know. Um, if you missed the first part, which if you do recall from other things, the second part was canceled due to unforeseen circumstances. All of these videos after they have ended will be up on YouTube on the department's YouTube page. So feel free to go back there and watch them as much as you want, reference them. And if you have any questions or anything, feel free to shoot me an email or contact anybody at the department and they'll get us in touch. So without further ado, I'm gonna go on and hand it over to Jay Wallen, who is a Hobie Pro Team member there's Jay. Jay, take it away. Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, happy to be here and happy to uh, answer all of y'all's questions. We're going to talk kayak fishing today, which uh, if you guys follow me or know anything about what I do, that's kind of my jam. I'm uh, going to cover a couple different topics today, and I want you guys to feel free to interrupt me, ask me questions. Uh, you know, that's what I'm here for is to help you guys learn a little bit. So I want to be, uh, be able to answer your questions. So don't hesitate at all to interrupt me. And, you know, I, I've got the chat pulled up here beside me. So if you want to type out a question, I can see your questions and uh, be happy to answer everything that I'm able to answer. But uh, the first thing I want to talk about with kayaks, of course, is safety. Uh, you know, we're, we're out on the water. We're in small crafts. Uh, safety is, is paramount. Um, and obviously, the first thing that goes along with safety is you guys wear your PFDs when you're out on the water. Uh, I prefer an inflatable PFD. I actually meant to bring them today, but I totally forgot. But uh, an inflatable PFD is great for the summertime. Uh, you know, a lot of people prefer the high flotation foam filled PFDs. Uh, it really doesn't matter as long as it's a Coast Guard approved PFD, but guys, let's get home to our families. Let's get home to our loved ones, uh, you know, what, what we often don't think about when we're out there without a PFD is that we're also putting other people at risk. You know, if, if we turn up missing, then there's a whole group of people that have to come out looking for us. Uh, and at the end of the day, we just want to go home to our families and, and, you know, be able to get back out on the water to enjoy what we do. Uh, the second part of that is to always let someone know when you're getting on the water, where you're going to be on the water, uh, and let somebody know when you do get off the water. Uh, it's it's very important uh, aspect of, of the safety, uh, you know, safety aspect of what we do. Uh, the next thing that uh, goes along with safety is clothing. Dress for the elements. You know, it's it's getting to be summertime right now. Uh, get you a big brimmed hat. Wear some sunscreen. And the number one sunburn that I see for kayak anglers is on the top of your thighs and your legs. A lot of us don't really think about that. It's happened to me so many times, it's not even funny. You get out on the kayak for the first time in the season and your legs are sticking straight out because you're, you know, you're sitting on a kayak and your legs will absolutely get roasted. So, you know, wear some pants that are breathable, you know, good UPF protection uh, or lather up that sunscreen. Uh, and then in the winter time, you know, make sure you've got a, a, a change of dry clothes. That's always a good idea to have in the boat with you. Uh, you know, dress for your elements, you know, be smart about it, uh, and also hydrate, you know, keep some liquids on the boat, uh, you know, water, Gatorade, that kind of stuff. Stay hydrated when you're out there. Even in the cold months, I find that I, I get dehydrated. I don't drink enough water, uh, and I feel that at the end of the day. So make sure you take water out with you uh, and stay hydrated. And uh, guys, if you see me looking down, I've got some notes here. I'm trying not to, to read straight off my notes, but I just want to stay, uh, stay on task with you guys. So I'm kind of referencing some of my notes. Um, the, other, the last thing I want to talk about was safety. Uh, I kind of, kind of hit it on it just a minute ago. You know, we're in small crafts. Um, you know, I fish out of the Hobie Pro Angler 14, and that is a bigger size boat, but it's still a small craft. Uh, some of these guys in these bass boats and runabouts and these bigger bigger boats, they're not looking for us. Uh, and, and even if they are, a lot of times we blend in with the with the background, and we can be really tough to see. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of options out there to stay visible. You can wear bright colored clothing. Um, there's a there's a company called Yak Attack that makes uh, 
these big orange flags with built-in 360 lights. That's an excellent option to stay visible when you're out on the water. Um, but, uh, you know, visibility, guys, make sure you're seen. Keep your head on a swivel. You know, when you're out there and you hear boats running around, just be aware of your surroundings and make, make good decisions. Uh, you've got to look out for you because I promise you, 99% of these boaters out there, they're not paying attention. They're not looking for a small kayak. So, um, you know, that, that's about it for safety. That's all I wanted to touch on. Just wanted to go through that real quick. Uh, do we have any questions before I, before I go any further? Uh, I have one, Jay, real quick. Sure, do absolutely. Do you fish from your kayak at night any? I do. I do actually fish from my kayak at night. Uh, and if you're going to fish at night, I highly recommend uh, some lights. I've got lights on my kayak. Uh, they're LED lights. They have a low draw on your back. <laughs> Um, there's a lot of options out there for lights. There's a lot of company lights, uh, but absolutely, if you're going to be out after dark, uh, that 360 light is all that's technically required by law. But from a safety point of view, I feel like that's not exactly adequate, depending on what kind of body of water you're on. Uh, so, you know, lights are, are, are a big thing to have on if you're going to be out there after dark. Definitely. Good question. Anything else before I keep going? All right, well, I'm gonna keep going. Uh, the next thing I wanna talk about is um, some of the bigger issues that come uh, from when kayaks and bass boats and pleasure boats and pontoon boats mix is on the boat ramps. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't familiar with the launching and loading etiquette uh, that's involved in, uh, you know, getting your boat on the water. Uh, and a lot of kayak guys, myself included, I've been guilty of this. Uh, we tend to congregate on the ramps and take our time. And, you know, we're trying to get a lot of gear in and out of our boats. Uh, the biggest thing is to do as much as you can before you make it to the boat ramp. You know, get your kayak unstrapped. Get as much of your gear into your boat as possible uh, so that you have to make the fewest number of moves at your boat ramp as possible so that you can get launched, get your stuff in the water and get moved off the ramp as quickly as possible. Um, you know, obviously uh, if you go to any boat ramp on a busy weekend, you know, the kayak guys aren't the only ones hogging up the ramps and uh, you know, being slow out there, but let's not, uh, you know, let's not hog the ramps. Let, let's make sure we're on and off the ramps as quickly as possible. Um, and, and number one thing for me, uh, if you're backing down a boat ramp and there's a big line of people at the ramp, turn your turn your headlights off. Uh, it's so it's so common and it's not something we think about, but for everybody else that's up there, you're blinding a lot of people. So uh, turn your headlights off when you're backing down the ramp. If you got a big line of people, uh, and, and just try and be as quickly as possible about getting on and off the water at the boat ramps. Um, that's just a big one for me. But uh, moving on, we'll talk about. Uh, rigging your kayak out so that you can uh, be as efficient as possible when you're on the water. Uh, one of the great things about kayaks is that you can rig your kayak and customize it any way you want to. You know, you can put things on the left side or the right side, camera mounts, uh, fish finders. Uh, there's so many different accessories out there uh, that you can rig up your kayaks and, and make them personal to you. Uh, and, and that's really one of the great things about kayak, uh, kayaks and kayak fishing is being able to customize them uh, to fit the style of fishing that you like to do. Uh, a lot of people like to live bait fish for catfish, or striper, crappie. Uh, you know, I've seen kayaks with a bunch of rod holders on them. You can actually spider rig uh, for crappie off of a kayak. Uh, I've seen some rigs set up for that. So uh, it's, it's just a really neat way to get on the water. It's cheap and it's efficient. Uh, and you can customize it to fish any way you like. Um, just kind of going through some of my notes here. Um, you know, storage. Storage on a kayak is very important. Uh, you know, whether you're selecting a kayak to buy or you're dealing with your current kayak, uh, some dry storage for clothing, cell phones, your wallet, your car keys, stuff like that. Uh, you know, if you don't have a hatch or something that you can keep some dry storage in, Get you a dry bag uh, and, and get it strapped to your kayak. You know, in the winter time, I like to keep an extra change of clothes just in case the, uh, you know, the, the 
the worst thing possible could happen, which is you going in the water in the wintertime. So bring some dry clothes, you know, bring, uh, bring whatever you want, but having dry storage on your kayak um, is, is a big deal. I, I, it's definitely needed. Um, another thing is, is, you know, rod sleeves for your fishing rods is an excellent idea. Uh, some guys just bring out one rod. Some guys bring out, you know, nine, 10 rods. And um, you can definitely get some things tangled up. Uh, so having rod sleeves on your rods is an excellent idea. Whenever you're fishing from a kayak, no matter what size kayak you're on, it's a small platform. And so being organized is key. Uh, the cleaner you can keep your deck space, uh, the more efficient you're going to be as far as fishing, not having things in your way. Uh, and it just makes things a little bit more relaxed when, you're, uh, when your workspace is a little bit cleaner and more organized. Uh, crates are also very useful for tackle organization. Uh, I don't know if you can see over my shoulder over here. I've got a crate. Uh, that's where I keep a lot of my tackle, uh, tackle boxes and baits that I'm not using. Uh, so having some kind of crate behind you is also an excellent way to stay organized and to keep all your gear kind of in one location. But it's also easy access. You know, you just reach behind you and you've got a crate right there. Um, when it comes to tackle, you know, I tend to keep one ta one box uh, for terminal tackle. I'll keep another box for hard baits like crankbaits, topwaters, uh, that kind of stuff. You can't tell I'm a bass fisherman, uh, so I, I tend to talk typically in bass lures. But, uh, you know, if you're a crappie fisherman or something, you don't, you don't really need to take out a whole lot of stuff. Uh, so for me, I try to keep it as minimal as possible, cut down on the weight, cut down on the clutter. Uh, but, uh, you know, try and get as many... Uh, as much of your tackle into as few boxes as possible. And I think that'll simplify uh, some of your time on the water. Uh, with soft plastics, I like to use those big gallon Ziploc bags, you know, and try to think about what you're gonna use for your day on the water uh, when it comes to soft plastics and just get you a uh, get you a big gallon Ziploc storage bag and you'd be surprised how many soft plastics uh, you can hold and stuff like that. But um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here real quick and just see if there's any questions. I, I don't want to talk too fast and, and get ahead of myself here. Does anybody have any questions for me? I've got another one just in case somebody else is trying to get time to type it in. Yeah. Um, have you ever kept fish to bring home while you're out on your kayak? And what do you do about a live well? Uh, you know, I have. Um, there are some actually some aftermarket live wells on the market. Um, obviously, I'm a Hobie guy, so, you know, I don't mean to plug Hobie, but they do have an aftermarket live well. Uh, they also make, uh, some people make fish bags uh, where you can put some ice in these bags and you can keep your fish uh, in those bags. But uh, a lot of kayaks do have uh, sufficient room and sufficient weight capacity. You could take a small cooler uh, with some ice and keep your fish on ice. Um, you know, I'm not sure as far as keeping your fish on a stringer uh, in the summer months, I'm not sure how safe that is. Uh, it, that could be safe, it could not, I'm not sure. Uh, you know, if it were me, I like to put my fish on ice because uh, as soon as that fish is dead, uh, it kind of starts the decaying process pretty quick this time of year. So, uh, you know, having a fish bag or a cooler uh, or an aftermarket live well is definitely something you can do if you're going to take your catch home to eat. Because uh, so, yeah, I know you'd mentioned uh, live bait and stuff, and I was thinking if somebody was going to take their minnows or whatever right. else, how would they do that easily? Right, right. Bait bucket yeah. is obvious thought, but that's just something else on the boat. <laughs> yeah, well, you can take a bait bucket out there. Uh, you know, I know uh, they make those little Plano uh, minnow buckets that you could hang over the side. I've seen people do that. Uh, so that's a good way to keep your bait. Uh, but then, like I said, there's also some aftermarket uh, live wells that you can, they're battery operated. Uh, they've got little hoses so you can suck water. Uh, into the live well and you can also pump it out so you keep good fresh water in there wow. or like I said you could just fill up a cooler or a fish bag with some ice uh, and just drop your fish in that fish bag but uh, yeah that's a great question uh, it's not something I do a lot uh, I should do it more often because you know I like to fish Cedar Creek and it's full of crappie uh, and then I live really close to Beaver Lake which is you know probably the state's best panfish lake uh, so that's a good question um, we have another question. It says, what about standing up to fish on a kayak? Yeah, standing up to fish. Uh, 
You know, standing up to fish uh, is something that's typically a learned uh, or a practiced thing to do. Uh, it typically requires a little bit wider of a kayak. Uh, you know, I, I'm in one of the wider kayaks, the, the Hobie Pro Angler. It's 38 inches wide, um, and it's super stable. Uh, I've also been in kayaks that were substantially narrower, like, um, you know, 36 inches wide. Uh, and, and it's really all about the kayak's secondary stability. Uh, kayaks go through different stages of stability. There's, uh, there's primary stability and then there's secondary stability. Uh, and I'll let Nathan from uh, uh, Canoe Kentucky, I think they did a webinar series and maybe going to do a follow-up to that. I'll let him get into uh, some of the stability issues with kayaks, but um, yeah, I definitely stand up and fish. I probably do 70% of my fishing standing up. Uh, it really just makes presenting your baits a lot easier. But uh, if you've not stood up in your kayak and fished before, I highly recommend doing that in the summertime with a PFD on just in case you lose your balance. Uh, it's not something you wanna do for the first time in the winter time. Um, I do stand up in the winter time and I don't advise it. I've, I've never, I'm gonna knock on wood, I've never fell, uh, fell in the lake before, but it's, it's still not a smart idea. Uh, even for me, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a seasoned guy standing up and fishing and I've had some close calls. I, I've had some close calls in the winter time. Uh, even in my Hobie, I've had some really close calls. I've had some boat wakes come by and uh, while I was standing and didn't know it, uh, I was drifting once on Watts Bar Lake, uh, and it was a 20 degree day, 30 degree water temperatures, and I was standing up and bumped into a stick up, and I almost went in. Uh, so it's not something I recommend doing in the winter time. If you're going to do it, uh, take note of your water temperatures and make sure that you're not uh, endangering yourself with cold water. Uh, but yeah, standing up and fishing is definitely doable. Uh, in kayaks. A lot of people think that you have to sit down and fish and, and you don't, you know, you just need to trust your equipment, uh, have good balance and practice. Practice makes perfect. Uh, and I highly recommend practicing in the summertime when the water's not cold. Um, I see another question here. Is there a site that has good maps for kayak fishing? Uh, that came from Dan. Yes, Dan, there, there are some great sites that have good maps. Uh, Navionics is an excellent resource. It's free. Uh, it's navionics.com. Uh, that's actually owned by Garmin, and their mapping uh, is, is fantastic. Uh, they've got maps of most lakes. Uh, obviously, some of the smaller lakes have, have not been mapped, but uh, most lakes in the state of Kentucky have been mapped. Uh, even some of the rivers uh, and some of the creeks have some pretty good mapping on them. Uh, and they'll show ramp locations, um, you know, launch locations, anywhere you can get in on the lake. Uh, another good resource, aside from Navionics, is going to be Google Earth. Uh, you know, you can use Google Earth to find launch locations, uh, see the structure on the lake and different types of cover. Uh, I will say, though, uh, oftentimes on Navionics and on Google Earth, they may mark a boat ramp, but it may be private. So before you go somewhere and just think because there's a boat ramp symbol on Navionics. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a public launch. Uh, so make sure before you launch, you either uh, confirm that it's public or you get permission to launch uh, where you're going. I don't want to recommend anybody launching on uh, private waters that, that can get you in trouble pretty quick. So make sure before you launch places, make sure you know where you're launching. Make sure it's either public or you have permission. I will say uh, the department yeah. does have a where to fish tab on our page, it'll give you exact GPS locations of where things are and what amenities they have, such as like a restroom or a boat ramp, or if it's bank access and things like that to check out as well. Yeah, um, good call, Andrew. Another I've thing actually that, used that one of our writers, Lee, did is he did the Blue Waters Trails series, and he talks about all these great kayaking locations and where they are and how long the floats and stuff take and what to expect. So that's another good thing to look yeah, into. Yeah, that, that Blue Water thing that uh, Lee did is excellent because most of the blue water trails that he highlighted, you're not going to find information on Navionics. You're not going to find that uh, on some of these mapping apps. So uh, definitely get on Fish and Wildlife's website. Uh, that blue water trails, that's a jewel. Uh, I'm really glad that Lee did that because 
so many of these floats, uh, there's no way you would ever know about where the put-ins and take-ins are. And that kind of goes to Nick Arnold's question on here. He asked, what's the best, me best method to float by yourself as far as put-in and take-out? Um, you know, floats are very difficult to pull off by yourself. Uh, you know, if you can arrange for someone to pick you up, that's always better. Uh, I don't do a whole lot of float trips by myself. I, you know, we usually have a buddy. We usually utilize the buddy system. And uh, typically what I've done in the past is we'll identify our takeout spot. We'll park a buddy's truck at our takeout spot. And then we'll drive back up to wherever we're going to put in, launch our kayaks, and then float down to our buddy's truck uh, to get us loaded up and then go back and pick up our other truck. So uh, floating by yourself is tough. Um, you know, I highly recommend, uh, you know, giving somebody a call and seeing if you can get a ride back uh, to your to your vehicle. I do have a buddy in uh, in Tennessee and uh, he's pretty sneaky with his float trips. He'll put in by himself. And then when he goes to take out, he actually calls Uber. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should recommend that or not, but uh, it is an option. Uh, that's something that he does. Is he'll call Uber to come pick him up and take him back to his vehicle. So. Hey, we live in uh, 2021. If you can use Uber to uh, help you with a float trip, why not? But uh, I, good will say, I will say also this, the webinar that got canceled, this was what this was going to cover was how to plan a float trip. So whoever we get as our expert, such as Jay here, will probably have lots of great ideas on how to do that. Cause I'm planning to find somebody that extensively kayaks a lot yeah. to try to help answer these questions. Cause I read that question. And I was like, I have no idea how I do that. Unless it was right. a lake that I fished. I feel like lakes would be easier to fish alone oh, yeah. with flowing water. But Definitely. Flo flowing water is very difficult by yourself. There's, there's no question about it. Uh, which is why that, that's a good question. Because uh, I, I don't really know what the best answer is to that. Uh, you know, I'm more of a lake fisherman. I like getting out on the big bodies of water, like Kentucky Lake and stuff. That's kind of what I enjoy most. But, uh, but there's, some, there's some excellent floats. Uh, in this state and you know that blue water trail that uh, uh, I think Andrew put the link up there in the chat that's an excellent resource uh, but I highly recommend if you can go with a buddy especially on a float trip uh, I don't think there's any question that flowing water can be a bit more dangerous than uh, than our lakes so uh, I think it's always a good idea to go with a buddy when possible uh, so those are some great questions guys thank you and, I did think of another one. Yeah, go uh, ahead. If you're on a flowing water system, like say Elkhorn Creek, you know, there is canoe places that rent kayaks and canoes for people. And sometimes they do offer ferrying services. So you could put in float, call them, they come pick you up and take you back to your vehicle for a fee. But you right. have to get that scheduled ahead of time. That's always something to think about. Those local yeah, I know, community I know people. Canoe Kentucky used to do that. They used to have a ferry service. Um, you know, I'm not sure what their schedule is. I don't think they run all the time, so you need to call ahead and make sure that they can accommodate you. But uh, that is a great point. That's a great resource there, especially on Elkhorn Creek. I'm sure there's other places that do that on other major streams and stuff as well. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, so just, you know, like I said, Google Earth's a great resource if you're looking at the stretch of water that you want to fish. Look around for uh, little bait shops and, uh, you know, kayak shops and look for different uh, – Look for different things along your route on the water and, you know, call these people and, and just see uh, if they'd be willing to help you out. Uh, it's de definitely a good idea to, uh, to get some help with your floats. But uh, I'm looking forward to that other webinar series uh, with doing the, doing the float because I'm not an expert on floats, uh, not by any stretch. So uh, I'll be interested to see some of the answers to these questions as it involves floats. So make sure you tune in for that too, definitely. Definitely. Great questions, guys. Anything else? All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of move on into uh, the actual act of fishing from your kayak, which is kind of the primary topic here with uh, with what we're talking about today. Uh, and I'm gonna reference my notes a little bit, but uh, you know, it kind of goes back. Uh, the first part of my notes goes right back. Uh, you know, somebody said, "What about standing up to fish on a kayak?" And many kayaks do offer the ability to stand. Uh, I will say that not all do. Uh, so. I wouldn't say that you can stand from any kayak because it may not necessarily be safe to do so. Um, but it's dependent upon you and your comfort level as well. Uh, you know, you, you need to have pretty good balance. You're going to be on water. Uh, it's not going to be stable. You know, water's, no matter what, water's always moving. Uh, 
so you need to be pretty uh, pretty comfortable with your with your lower body uh, and your balance. Um, one of the things I learned early on uh, in kayak fishing, uh, if you're going to stand, you need to maintain three points of contact with your kayak. That's going to give you the best uh, the best form of stability. And so what I like to do if I'm standing is obviously I've got two points of contact with my feet. And then what I'll do is I'll, I'll use the back of my legs on my calves and I'll kind of push those into the back of my seat. I'm gonna kind of lean over. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see, <laughs> we'll try this, but right here's the kind of the part of my seat. Uh, if you can see my finger kind of horizontally right there, that's where my seat uh, ends. And what I like to do is push my calves into the back of the seat. And you'd be surprised how much more stability you get out of having that third point of contact. Uh, so that's really important is to have three points of contact uh, in your kayak when you're standing up to fish. Um, you know, most of my kayak fishing and most everyone that does kayak fish, most of your fishing is probably going to be done from the seated position. Uh, you know, and that's where a high seat, I think, comes in handy, unless you're in some swift moving water and you might want to sit a little bit lower. Um, you know, the higher up you sit, you are going to raise your center of gravity. Uh, and so no matter how high you get, that will decrease your stability a little bit. Uh, but I do like sitting up high, it kind of increases your field of vision. You're able to see targets better like brush um, and stick ups and, and different, uh, different types of cover. Uh, so the higher up you sit, the, the better you're going to be able to see down into the water uh, and just see what's around you. Uh, so I do like sitting up uh, as high as possible. Um, you know, talk about, uh, I want to talk about some rod lengths. Uh, a lot of people ask me, uh, you know, do you like using a shorter rod when you kayak fish? Uh, generally speaking, no, I, I don't necessarily shy away from a longer rod. Uh, but if you're pitching and flipping soft plastics uh, or if you're in tight quarters and you're trying to get in and around a lot of thick cover, I think a shorter rod is going to play to your advantage. Uh, it's, it's a lot easier to cast when you're in tight quarters. Uh, you know, like I said, no matter what size kayak you're in, uh, you're going to be in some tight quarters. Your, your kayak's going to be, um, you know, it's, it's a small, intimate area. And so using a little bit shorter rod, I think is going to play to your advantage. You're going to be more accurate uh, and you're just going to be more comfortable, uh, you know, trying to get your baits and your, your lures presented uh, the way you need to do it. So, uh, you know, I, I typically try to stay uh, seven feet or under with my rods. You know, I don't like to go much over a seven foot rod. Uh, I actually tried to float and fly on Dale Hollow in the wintertime out of my kayak. And that's, probably some of the most frustrating fishing I've ever tried to do. You know, I was using an eight, nine foot rod and uh, it was not pretty. Uh, I hooked several smallmouth. I never did get any of them in the kayak. So um, I don't think there's any question that using a little bit shorter rod is probably gonna be a lot easier uh, for you to kayak fish from. So if you're going out kayak fishing, leave the longer rods at home, uh, take some of your shorter, shorter rods out there. Um, you know, a lot of people, especially if you're live bait fishing, uh, like I said, for striper, uh, catfish, bluegill, crappie, that kind of stuff, uh, rod holders. Rod, rod holders are a great tool. It uh, allows you to be hands-free. So if you've got a paddle, uh, you know, you want to set your rod down, you don't have to have it sitting in between your legs and it's going to be in your way. Uh, so invest in a couple of rod holders. That's, that's a great accessory to have on your kayak that's gonna make fishing a lot easier for you. Um, you know, I, I already touched on it again uh, before, but I'll touch on it again. Being organized on the water is key. You know, keep your baits tidy. Uh, you know, try to only get one rod out at a time. I'm guilty of that. I'll have two or three rods laying out at a time uh, just because I'm a stubborn bass fisherman. I, I think that you know, I need to have three, four or five different rods out throwing a bunch of different stuff. But, uh, you know, just try to keep your area as clean and tidy as possible. Uh, and that'll just maximize your enjoyment of the water. Nothing is more frustrating than trying to deal with tangled up rods in a kayak. Trust me. Um, you know, if you're new to kayak fishing, 
when you first get out on the water and you start starting to learn how to cast out of a kayak, it's going to be a little different. You know, if you're used to fishing from the bank or if you're used to fishing from a, you know, a different kind of boat, um, the, the kayak's going to move with you. So when you go to make a big cast, you know, things are going to be moving with you. So start out slow, make some light, lighter casts. Uh, you know, you don't want to be hauling off and chucking a big bait because it's, it's just going to be awkward. Uh, so start off slow, make small casts uh, until you kind of work your way up and get comfortable with the fact that your kayak's going to move. Uh, it's going to move out from under you and you just got to get comfortable with it. Uh, and it can be a little, a little unnerving at first. Um, and that's all about learning your equipment. Uh, and learning the limitations of your equipment, more importantly. Um, I actually, once you get good enough, you'll actually be able to use certain baits to move your kayak. Uh, you know, baits like a crankbait or spinnerbait. And again, I'm a bass fisherman, so I'm relating to uh, bass lures. But, uh, you know, using a crankbait, the resistance from the crankbait can actually help steer your kayak in the direction you want it to go. Uh, so that's actually a neat little trick. Uh, that you can use to uh, help position your kayak without using your pedal drive or without using a paddle uh, and spooking fish. Uh, you know, anytime you're in a kayak, we're stealthier uh, than anybody else on the water, but uh, you want to paddle quietly. You want to pedal quietly. You know, try not to make any sudden moves uh, or, uh, or any loud noises when you're out there in your kayak. Uh, like I said, we're, we're the stealthiest, stealthiest people on the lake uh, on, or on the water. So, uh, you know, limit your moves and try and be as, as quiet as possible. Uh, and the ultimate result is you're going to put more fish in the boat. Um, just going to kind of keep moving on here. Uh, has anybody got any more questions for me? Keep, keep, keep asking me questions. I, I love the questions. No, no I, say, I will ask, has yeah, a fish ahead. ever pulled you around? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I got into a big striper on Lake Cumberland. Uh, I was throwing a little spinning rod for bass. Uh, I'm trying to think what I was throwing. I was throwing a little uh, quarter-ounce uh, swim bait, real little itty-bitty swim bait. And I hooked about a 25, 30-pound striper, and it literally pulled me all over the place. I couldn't do anything with it. I fought that striper for probably 20 minutes and he finally got me wrapped up in one of those uh, little sapling trees on Lake Cumberland. He broke my line. I was pretty devastated, but uh, we call those sleigh rides because uh, that's pretty much what you're doing. You're hooked up and you're going for a ride. Uh, so I went for a couple sleigh rides on Lake Cumberland with some striper. Um, I've also been pulled around by uh, muskie on Cave Run Lake. Uh, that's another really fun thing to do uh, is if you're comfortable with it is musky fishing out of a kayak. Uh, musky fishing in general, as, as most of us know, is very difficult. They're the fish of 10,000 casts and uh, they don't like to eat very often, or at least they don't like to eat my lures very often. But uh, when you hook up on one of those things in a kayak, you're going for a ride. You are absolutely going for a ride. Um, and that kind of reminds me of another thing. Um, be prepared to deal with some toothy critters if you're fishing places that, uh, that have them. Uh, a pair of good pair of fish grips and a good pair of long nose, uh, needle nose pliers are two excellent tools that you always want to keep in your kayak. Uh, for me personally, I keep a little tool kit and I keep a first aid kit. Uh, you know, I've got scissors, pliers, and uh, fish grips in my kayak at all times because you'd really just never know what you're gonna have to deal with out there on the water. So, um, you know, the old Boy Scout adage of always being prepared applies, be prepared for anything. Um, you know, I keep fire starting materials and dry clothes uh, and extra tools just because you, you really do never know what you're gonna end up dealing with. Um, but yeah, big fish have definitely pulled me around. And you know what, that's, that's part of the fun. Uh, you're in a small boat, you're out there, and uh, nothing's more intimate than, than kayak fishing. Uh, it, it, it really is a lot of fun. And when you hook into a big monster fish, um, it's pretty enjoyable to go for a ride. I uh, see another question coming in. Uh, use my fly rod. Uh, I do not have a kayak, but rather a one-man pontoon drift boat. I want to go to Elkhorn. Can you shore up on these waters and wade? 
or would you be trespassing on a lot of these tailwaters? I can answer that. That's a one. Really good question. Yeah, I can answer that one a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So you... there is this weird stipulation within Franklin County. I think I'm getting this correct, where you can wade, but everywhere else it applies by the rules that you cannot step foot on solid ground. So as long as you're floating and not attached, you're okay. But in Franklin County, you can pull over and wade and fish like that. I think that's the only place I'd have to check. Yeah, up on that I, I think you're right, Andrew. Uh, I remember back in the day, uh, there was a court case actually over that. Uh, and I knew it pertained to Elkhorn Creek. I'm not sure of the, the particular rules there, but uh, typically speaking, when you're on the water, uh, the water is public, but typically the land underneath the water is not necessarily public. Um, but like you said, it, it depends. Franklin County, I believe, does have a little different uh, ruling that came out of the court case. Uh, so, that, Nick, that's a very um, that's a very iffy answer on your question there. Um, I would just assume typically that uh, if you're waiting, you could be on private land. So. Uh, you know, you need to take take note of where you're at and whether or not you have permission to uh, to wade, because it technically, in some places, it could be trespassing. Uh, Andrew, I hope I didn't misstate that. No, no, that's a uh, that's correct as I understand it. My suggestion, if you're going somewhere new and you're not sure, is to call our info center or go to my county contact on our website and try to get a hold of your local conservation officer and get their input on it because we don't want anybody to get in trouble for doing something they didn't know. And we always want to have the good view to the public as anglers that, you know, we're not just trespassing everywhere. We're trying to use the resource correctly. We always want to pick up trash and things like that. So we've lost a lot of access to people abusing the resource and that's not what we want anymore. So don't be afraid to ask the question. That's a great question. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, guys. And another thing, I mean, I know a lot of us as kayak anglers, um, you know, a lot of us are environmentally conscious, um, please, please, please pick up your trash. Um, you know, even if it's not yours, if you see some trash out there, please get it out of our lakes. Uh, you know, if you, if you snag someone's old line, you know, pull it back into your boat and just throw it behind you and take it with you. Um, you know, too many times I see people reel in some old line and they get their bait back and they just toss the old line back out. Um, you know, let, let's do our part to, uh, to really clean up some of our lakes. Uh, you know, we actually do a pretty good job here in Kentucky, but there are some places that I go to that they just get trashed. And no matter how much you pick up stuff, you know, people keep trashing these places. So if we as a, as a group, uh, as kayak anglers and just anglers in general, um, you know, if you can just make the commitment every time you go fishing, I promise you, you can find some trash somewhere. Take something home with you. You know, if you find some trash somewhere, make it a point to take something back out of the lake with you. Um, I, I want to, I do want to mention this. Uh, one of the elite series bass professionals, Carl Jacobson from Australia, a couple weeks ago, uh, he actually missed the cut uh, at Lake Gunnersville in a tournament. And instead of going home, he and his wife went out on a day that he didn't make the cut to fish the last day of the tournament. And they picked up, I don't know how many bag, 50 some trash bags full of trash from Lake Gunnersville. And I thought that was so awesome of him to do that. You know, he could have loaded up his stuff and went home and, and called it a tournament, but he stuck around and, and helped clean up the lake. Uh, and, and I think that just really spoke to me. And I really kind of want to relay that to you guys. You know, anytime you go out, if you see an opportunity to make, make our fisheries, uh, just a little bit better, you know, take some of that stuff out with you. It's not hard. Most of these boat ramps have got garbage cans and dumpsters and places you can dump this trash off. It's not that hard to take some of that stuff out. So please, as kayak anglers, let's do our part uh, just to, to help take a little bit of trash out of our lakes. It'll make everyone's experience so much better. So uh, pre appreciate y'all doing that. Uh, do I have any more questions? Nick, that was an excellent question, by the way. All right. Well, if I don't have any more questions, I'm going to kind of kind of keep moving through my notes here. And, uh, you know, we talked. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, sorry, somebody's trying to ask a question, but you're breaking up a little bit. On I got a question about a specific place. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Better? Yeah, go ahead. Are you able to? I have a question about a specific place. I'm new to, to kayak fishing, and I've got a place at No Lynn, and we want to uh, go to the tailwaters, and we've heard you to go to Brownsville. And I'm looking for a spot that I've got a PDL. Okay, you're you're kind of breaking up on me. And I tell you what, if I can't, I really can't, I really can't hear you very good. If you could type your question out, it'd be a lot. Is it safe enough for a PDL? Uh, is there a place like that to tell you if it's deep enough? Yeah, I think his question is generally how does he find an access point there? Okay, in that new okay. area. I think is what he's after, but we're losing okay. him in the signal area. Yeah, I that's hope that's tough. correct, Dan. If not, you can just send me that directly, and we'll try to get that answered through the chat as well. Okay. Yeah, you know, uh, unfortunately, I don't. I fished no end, but I've never fished below the tailwaters before. Um, you know, I think definitely use the um, the blue water trails um, feature on the Fish and Wildlife website. Look at Navionics uh, and Google Earth. Those are all some great resources that you can kind of help. Uh, pin down some of your launch and takeout locations. Um, I, I really apologize. I can't. I can't give you a better answer. Uh, hopefully, the guy that they have come on to do the blue water or the float float trips, uh, whenever they do that webinar, hopefully he'll be able to better answer your question. Um, so, so sorry, I couldn't give you a better answer on that, uh, Dan. Sorry about that. But yeah, we'll definitely try to get that question addressed yeah. to the next one. If not, I'll personally go bug some people and find the answer on the best places to find resources for those things. That's what we're there here for, is to help you guys get out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and that's what's so nice about kayaks is that, uh, you know, whether your budget is a couple hundred dollars or a couple thousand dollars, you can get out on the water. You don't have to have, uh, you know, a lot of money to get into this sport uh, or, or just to get out and use the water recreationally. Uh, my wife, for example, she she could care less about fishing, uh, but she loves to get out in her kayak and just be outside on the water. That's that's really what it, what it boils down to. That's what it's all about uh, is getting out on the water. And lucky for us here in Kentucky, we have an outstanding fish and wildlife department. They give us all these resources. Um, you know, trust me, I travel the country and fish uh, fish out of my kayak. And we've got it made here in Kentucky. Um, the amount of resources and the amount of access that we have as anglers, um, it's unparalleled. There, there's not any other place that I've been to uh, where the department invests so much into being able to get anglers on the water. Uh, so make sure you use those resources on the Fish and Wildlife website. You know, that's fw.ky.gov. Uh, and you can go on there. They'll, they'll tell you where to fish. Um, you know, dip, different bodies of water and, and some of the creel surveys. There's just so many resources on there that you can get. Um, I know the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife also puts out a lot of fish attractors. Uh, and what's so cool about that is they have those uh, fish attractors uh, in, in formats that you can actually download to your computer and you can put them on a fish finder uh, with the GPS coordinates and go straight to them. Uh, Dan, I see your question over here in writing. Says you're looking to put in at no end tailwaters. You hear you can float to Brownsville. How can you find out if it's deep enough uh, for a PDL uh, or if it has any rapids? So that's a great question, Dan. And like I said, unfortunately, I don't have direct knowledge of that. So I don't want to uh, give you bad information uh, and guess on that. So uh, Andrew's already said that uh, whenever they get their guy on here to do the next webinar for uh, float trips, uh, hopefully he can answer your question. Uh, and if not, I know Andrew's got some great resources here at Fish and Wildlife. I'm sure he can get you an answer to that. Yeah. Um, Dan, I would check out the where to fish thing on our website, and that'll kind of give you an idea of where you can put at relative to the area you're in. I will make the comment that the depth of the water also depends on current weather conditions as well. If you've had a lot of rain, the water will be a little bit deeper in that area which if you go to the USGS website, they usually have 
indicators along certain parts that tell you the flow and all that. But hopefully our next presenter will cover all that stuff. But if he does not, I know you asked this question last time too. And we didn't have the right presenter there either. We will get this answered for you. <laughs> I wrote this yeah. question down. We will get it. <laughs> also, you know, if you're doing these float trips below our tailwaters, uh, make sure you're aware of uh, scheduled dam releases. Um, those can be those can be pretty substantial. Like uh, you know, below Wolf Creek Dam at Lake Cumberland, you really got to be on your toes and and pay attention to some of these scheduled dam releases because uh, you can get in trouble in a hurry with some of those. So make sure you guys are careful with that stuff. Um, you know, always wear your PFDs. Let somebody know where you're at, and uh, just be really careful fishing below these dams, guys. They can um, they can be killers. They really can. It can happen quick, so uh, don't want to don't want to scare you guys, but just be careful about fishing below these dams. Um, all right, guys. Well, I'm going to kind of just shuffle through my notes a little bit and kind of finish up uh, covering a couple things that I wanted to cover. Um, something that a lot of people don't think about fishing from a kayak uh, is trolling. You can actually troll from your kayak. Um, I've got a pedal drive system, obviously, with the Hobie, but there's a lot of other brands out there that have pedal drives. You've got Natives and Old Town. Uh, Jackson has a pedal drive. Uh, so, But it's not limited to just guys with pedal drives. Uh, you know, you can definitely paddle and troll. You might need a rod holder if you're going to troll and paddle. Uh, but that's a very effective technique um, just to locate fish. Uh, whether you're trolling a big crankbait or, uh, you know, I – I've been known to troll Alabama rigs from time to time. Uh, so, you know, trolling is an excellent way to, uh, to locate fish and cover water when you're, when you're on new bodies of water. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop right here. I uh, got a message from Richard Spaulding. Uh, for anyone wanting to start kayaking, what would be a good one? Uh, you know, I get this question a lot. What's a good kayak for me? Uh, the answer to that question is anything that you are that gets you on the water and it is comfortable for you. Um, they make so many different kayaks for a reason, and that's because not one kayak is going to be well suited uh, for everybody. So what I tell everybody is demo, demo, demo. Uh, you know, get into as many different kayaks as you possibly can um, before you purchase one. You know, I would never purchase a vehicle without driving it first, uh, and you shouldn't get into a kayak or purchase a kayak without trying it first. Uh, I, I would recommend Canoe Kentucky uh, down here in Frankfurt, uh, Peaks Mill right here on Elkhorn Creek. Uh, they do stock a number of different brands and different models of kayaks. Uh, and typically, uh, I don't want to speak for Nathan at Canoe Kentucky, but, uh, you know, they will do demos and let you get out and try. Uh, a lot of different kayaks. So, you know, what's right for you may not be right for me. Uh, what's comfortable for you may not be comfortable for me. Uh, so the number one thing, obviously our budget is going to come into play. Uh, you know, you want something that you can afford, uh, but it's got to be comfortable. Um, you know, if it's not comfortable for you, then you're not going to enjoy your time on the water uh, and you're not going to get the most out of your investment in a kayak. Um, I was out on Cedar Creek Lake a few weeks ago and uh, there was a man out there with his with his little girl, um, and they were out there in some uh, you know some cheaper kayaks. Uh, you could tell they they picked them up maybe at Walmart or or uh, one of the big box stores or something. And and she was having a ball. This little girl was having a blast out there with her dad. And I heard him say, uh, "Honey, we're going to have to go here soon. This this kayak is killing my back." Uh, and he was having a tough time in it. Um, and I saw him go over and get on the bank and he had to get out just because it was hurting his butt, hurting his back. Uh, so that's why I say get out and demo these kayaks. You know, get your butt in as many different seats as you possibly can. Uh, because you may get in one and just be like, God, this is terrible. I, there's no way I could sit in this. Um, and you don't want to find that out when it's too late. So, so get out to some of these kayak dealers and demo as many different boats as you possibly can because there's not a a right or wrong answer uh, to that question. It's it's whatever fits you uh, and your budget. But, uh, you know, the, the biggest answer to that is whatever gets you out on the water and, and is comfortable for you to be in. So. 
Uh, I have something to add to that last question. Yeah, yeah, go right um, ahead. So as far as which boat works for you, the first part of this series that we did covered that. It was like, which kayak is right for me? And that video is on YouTube. And we did have some connection issues, but I'm working with Canoe Kentucky to re-record that first part and put that on there. That way all that info is out there. And they went over a lot of the pros and cons of the different styles to kind of give people an idea of what might work for them. So that's something to look up. And there's all lots of resources on the internet you can look up to with people's opinions and thoughts on stuff and things like that. So definitely, definitely. Um, Nick Arnold asked a question. He said he wants to install a trolling motor. Um, he said on his boat, I assume, I assume you mean your kayak, you want to install a trolling motor. Don't you have to register it the same as you would uh, your boat? And the answer is yes, you absolutely do. If you put an electric uh, or a combustion engine, either one, uh, whether it's a kayak, canoe, John boat, whatever, if it's an electric or gas powered motor, you do have to register that with your county clerk. Uh, you said, is it the same cost as registering a full on motorboat? Um, the cost varies and it's typically based on uh, the value of your vessel. Um, but there are registration fees and you do have to register that. Uh, I highly advise you to call your county clerk. Uh, they can typically give you better, uh, better information than I can as far as cost. Uh, but but the answer is yes. If you if you get a trolling motor or a motor, you do have to register that with your county clerk. Yeah, good question. Good question. I get that a lot. Uh, any other questions? You guys, you guys are coming with some good questions here. All right, I don't see any questions popping up just yet. So I'll. Oh wait. Uh, Richard, if I remember right, the cost for kayak is ten dollars. Again, I, I don't know. I registered a kayak uh, last year because I did have a motor uh, pushing mine for a little while. Um, I don't remember what I paid. I don't think it's a flat rate, though. I think it depends on uh, you have to register your specific boat uh, with, with the county clerk. So, again, uh, I'm going to have to defer to the county clerk on that. Uh, but just know that if you do want to put a, a propulsion of some sort like that on your boat, uh, you do need to register that. So call your county clerks uh, and they should be able to get you a, a little bit better answer uh, than what I can as far as cost. Just know that there is there is registration that has to be done if you're going to do that. So good question. Uh, so I, I just got done talking about, uh, you know, trolling as a, as a method of fishing from your kayak. It's absolutely doable uh, and it's actually very effective. Uh, especially if you're just trying to locate some fish, uh, you know, schools of fish. Uh, something I've always wanted to do and I've never done is uh, I've always wanted to troll on Lake Cumberland uh, for big striper. I couldn't imagine getting a striper hit uh, trolling uh, out of a kayak. I, that's always something I've wanted to do. Uh, hopefully one of these days I'll get down there and make that happen. But uh, just wanted to just wanted to throw that out there that there's anything you can do in a boat Fishing wise, you can pretty much do in a kayak. It's just going to be at a smaller, uh, smaller scale. Um, you know, I talked about some of the tools, tools of the trade from kayak fishing. Uh, a landing net is, is an obvious choice. Uh, sometimes it can be a little hard to uh, to lift those fish and get them in the boat. Uh, you know, and you end up leaning over to one side when you're trying to uh, lift and stuff. And if you're not in the most stable of kayaks you know, sometimes that can get you in a predicament. So I do highly recommend a landing net, uh, maybe a shorter a shorter handled landing net with a, a deeper bag uh, net, uh, just, just to help you get those fish in the boat a little bit easier. Um, but, uh, you know, we talked about first aid kit. First aid kit's a great tool uh, to have in your kayak. You never know when you're gonna um, get stuck with a hook or something or, uh, or get cut or something, always bring a first aid kit and some tools, needle nose pliers, scissors, uh, line clippers. Those are always some, some great things to have in your kayak. Um, and, you know, I, I just kind of want to close with the beauty of kayak fishing is the ability to get on the water uh, easily uh, and a lot cheaper than guys in uh, these big bass boats or, you know, the, these other boats. There's no fuel, no gas. You're, you're the gas for the, uh, for the propulsion. Uh, and, and with a kayak, you can reach some uh, 
some places on these lakes and fisheries that are not accessible by other people. You know, that that's some of the, the great things about a kayak. You know, like I take Cedar Creek Lake, for example. I don't know if you guys have been there, but it's full of stick-ups and standing timber. Uh, and it's really hard for some of these guys in these boats to get back in to some of these places. Uh, they just physically can't fit their boats back into some of those stick-ups. Uh, and me in a kayak, I can just snake right through some of that stuff. And you get access to, to water and fish that a lot of people don't get access to. Uh, so that's one of the beautiful things about kayak fishing uh, is being able to get our boats into really shallow uh, places uh, or get through some shallow places. You know, a lot of these lakes, as they start to silt in at the headwaters, oftentimes if you can get through those shallow silty spots and get back in the main tributaries, uh, it deepens up and you can get into some really excellent fishing uh, that's really untouched by anybody in these uh, bass boats because they can't, they can't get through there and access that. So don't be afraid to get into some of that shallow water, some of the thick cover, the stick ups, that's what these kayaks are made for. And that's what gives you the advantage uh, over everyone else in, uh, in some of these bigger boats. Um, but uh, I'm going to kind of stop right there and just see if anybody has any more questions, any comments, any more input. Um, Nick, Nick had a question. You spoke about muskie. You want to start targeting them on the fly. Wow, man, that, that's awesome. You live closer to Green River than you do Cave Run. Uh, do the muskie run into the tailwaters? or do you have to get on the lake? So my understanding of Green River Lake, uh, there's a lot of musky in Green River Lake. That's probably the, uh, you know, Cave Run gets all the glory uh, for the musky in the state of Kentucky, uh, but Green River Lake's definitely the number two spot. Um, and, and they're from the dam all the way up the headwaters. Uh, I've hooked into musky on Green River Lake all over the place. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name. Uh, if you go up past the dam, Wilson Creek and uh, Robinson Creek, those are some of the two main areas that I've caught a lot of muskie on, uh, on Green River Lake, but they're found throughout that entire uh, river system uh, on Green River Lake. So um, I don't know if the headwaters are going to be better uh, than the main lake. Uh, you also said the tailwaters. Um I'm not sure if musky are in the tailwaters. I would assume that they are. Um, I'll tell you another couple of great fisheries in the state is the Kentucky River, uh, especially the upper portions of the Kentucky River. I know the department does some stocking there, uh, but the Kentucky River is an excellent underutilized musky fishery. Uh, and Dale Hollow, uh, Dale Hollow actually has quite a bit of muskies in it. Uh, although Dale Hollow can be a little tough, I'm not sure as far as locations on where to target muskie in Dale Hollow, but there are some monster muskie in Dale Hollow too. But uh, Green River, as far as I know, uh, you know, from the headwaters to the dam, and, and I have to believe that they're also in the tailwaters. Um, although I think the main lake uh, is probably where the greatest population of muskie are uh, on Green River. And I will say a great resource, if you're not sure uh, where to look for some of the species that you like to target, uh, Fish and Wildlife has uh, uh, their where to fish uh, menu option on their website. If you go to that and look at some of these lakes, they'll tell you what the primary species are uh, for each lake. So if there's a particular body of water that you're interested in, I uh, highly recommend that you go there and, uh, and look at all the different species. I'm telling you, there's so much information uh, I don't think enough people uh, know about uh, the, the resources that are available right there on Fish and Wildlife's website. So, yeah, um, Fish and Wildlife just dropped that link here in our chat. The, uh, uh, the other good thing out. about that is um, the fishing forecast. Exactly. That's, that's a good sheet. It tells you, gives them five-star ratings, two-star ratings for every major fish species found in that lake and also kind of general areas and things to try to catch them. And they've been pushing that pretty hard recently. And then we have our fishing reports they put out on social media where the actual regional biologists will talk about what they've seen and how people are catching them. So those are always good things you can find on the department's website webpage. So absolutely. Absolutely. We just want you to catch them. We don't care how you catch them. We're going to put all the info out there for everybody. We're not going right. to hide anything from you guys. <laughs> That's right. It's about getting people out there and you guys are successful on the water. Um, 
Guys, that's pretty much it for me. I do want to close. Uh, I got to give just a little small plug. Uh, you know, I know I'm primarily a bass fisherman. I know bass is pretty popular. Um, if you guys are interested at all in fishing some, you know, if you've got a little competitive bug about you and you want to get involved uh, in some kayak tournaments, uh, the Bluegrass Kayak Bass Fishing is one of our local grassroots trails here in the state of Kentucky. You can find us on Facebook. Uh, we actually have a tournament this weekend on Cedar Creek Lake, so welcome all of you guys to uh, come out to Cedar Creek Lake and fish with us. Um, if you're interested in a little bit higher level of competition on the national scene, the Hobie Bass Open Series, uh, they've got their own website. They're also on Facebook. Uh, that, that's a series that I fish. I travel the country uh, fishing these bass tournaments. And what's so great about some of these tournaments is it encourages you to go to bodies of water that maybe you've never been to. Uh, maybe you wouldn't otherwise go to them. Uh, for me, uh, I never would have gone to the Mississippi River in Wisconsin to fish. I just never would have done it. Uh, but we had a big tournament up there for our National uh, Bass Open Series Trail. One of the most beautiful places I've ever been to in my life. I go back every single year. Uh, and if it weren't for the tournament scene, I never would have even known about it. So highly recommend you guys, if you're interested in that kind of thing, uh, like I said, Bluegrass Kayak Bass Fishing uh, is your local state grassroots club. And then the Hobie Bass Open Series on the National Tournament Trail. Just had to, just had to shoot that in there. But I appreciate you guys having me. Um, you know, please, please, please utilize your fish and wildlife resources. There's so much great information out there. Uh, and I'm going to give a little bit of a personal plug for me. Uh, I'm on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and all that good fun social stuff. Jay Wallen Fishing is my handle. You can find me at all that stuff. Uh, and if there's questions that pop up after we log off here and, and you guys are like, man, I wish I'd asked that question. Uh, look me up on Facebook and shoot me a, shoot me a question. I don't care a bit to, to answer some of your guys' questions. Uh, and if I don't have the answer, you know, I can always uh, reach out to these fish and wildlife guys uh, and, and we can usually get you a pretty good answer. So uh, appreciate all you guys. Appreciate Fish and Wildlife for having me on. Uh, hopefully you gained a little bit out of this. Hopefully you learned something. Uh, and we just want to be a good resource here for you guys. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Jay, very much for all that. I do have to ask, since I helped you carry it in the room, can you give us a little bit of a boat tour? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, got a, I got Easton here. He's going to help me uh, with the video aspect of that, and we'll uh, I'll show you guys my boat. Yeah, so just kind of go over some features that are, you know, found on most boats, and then kind of give us an idea how you actually get it to the water. Sure. So we'll just start up here at the front of my boat. Uh, of course, I got my landing net that I talked about. I like to keep that here on the front of my boat. Guys, hang on just a second. I'm going to shut my laptop off so we're not echoing so bad. <laughs> All right, guys, sorry about that. Uh, so I got my landing net up here up front. Um, this is just a great tool. This thing floats, uh, weighs two pounds. As you can tell, it's pretty light, uh, but that's a great tool to keep, keep handy in your kayak. Um, this particular boat is the Hobie, uh, Hobie Mirage Drive. This is the uh, new 360. Uh, of course, we can pedal it in 360 degrees, so I'm able to go in uh, virtually any direction. Um, I've got a marine mat kit in this boat. Uh, marine mat and Sea Deck both make a lot of kits uh, that will fit just about every major manufacturer of kayaks. And what that does is if you're gonna stand uh, it gives you a kind of a soft, cushiony uh, platform to stand on. Um, another one of, one of the great accessories that you can have for your boat is going to be a kayak cushion seat. Uh, that's what allows you to sit in your kayak for hours at a time. Uh, you got to have a comfortable seat. Um, this particular boat has horizontal rod storage. Um, not every kayak is going to have horizontal rod storage, and that's where a good, uh, a good crate will come in handy. Uh, this is this is the Hobie H crate, uh, but it's basically just a glorified milk crate. Uh, but it does have some built-in rod holders. Uh, so if you don't have uh, the ability to store your rods horizontally, this right here will give you the ability to store some rods vertically. Um, also, a good cart, a good wheel cart. 
this is typically how I transport my kayak. Uh, these things can get pretty heavy. Obviously, I'm in a pretty good sized boat because uh, I'm a pretty good sized boy. But uh, having a good wheel cart will go a really long way. Um, like I said, having a good comfortable seat goes a long way too. Uh, something I never leave home without, even though I do have a pedal drive uh, kayak, you never know when things might happen. So I always keep a half a paddle uh, just in case of an emergency. Uh, any of you guys that have pedal driven kayaks, um, definitely, definitely always at least have a half a paddle. Ideally, you probably should keep a full paddle, uh, but I do keep half a paddle just in the case uh, my drive breaks down and I, I've got to get a find a way to get home. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that's pretty much my boat. It's a 14 foot kayak. It's 38 inches wide. Gives me a good, strong uh, platform to stand from. Um, you know, one thing we didn't talk about was fish finders. Uh, a lot of kayaks now are getting into the uh, fish finders. Um, I've got mine kind of mounted up here in the center. Uh, I use the big hummingbird uh, fish finder. And, and that's just a really great accessory. If you're going to bass fish or crappie fish, uh, if you're looking for bait or structure, uh, having a good depth finder uh, is key, really. Um, and, and the great thing about the depth finders is that these days you can get a really good depth finder for, you know, two, three hundred dollars. You don't have to spend a whole lot of money uh, to get a good depth finder. And you know anything that's going to give you water depth and water temperature is going to put you uh, above and beyond some of the other guys that are on the water uh, and, and help you put more fish in the boat. At the end of the day, that's what we want. We want to see you guys out on the water and have success on the water. Um, and hopefully some of these accessories and, and some of the ideas here in this boat will help you guys. Thank you, Jay. I was wondering about all that. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. One last thing I want to share with everyone is if you don't have a kayak yet, but you fish, we are giving away a kayak. It's a thousand dollar package. You'll get a Jackson bite. It's the 2021 model. You get a paddle and a life jacket and a spinning rod. Uh, all you have to do is if you're a current angler is take someone new who is 16 years or older and that has not purchased a license ever or within the last three years. And then you can go onto the department's page, log into your my profile, which you can create one if you don't, which is a great resource to have at all. You can purchase your license from there. It keeps track of all your licenses and checks and everything. And there'll be a tab on the side. They'll have a kayak giveaway. You click on it, you enter the new person's license number you took and you get a chance to win the boat. So every new person you take, you get another chance. So I suggest you get out there. I think last year we had 300 and something people enter. And we had a local guy in Lexington win the boat. We're doing it again this year. We've got till the end of August, I believe. Now that my brain has lost that memory. But yeah, just get out there and try it. And whoever you take new will also get a spinning rod as well to keep them out there going. So uh, if we don't have any more questions for me or Jay or anybody, that's perfectly fine. If you think of something else, shoot us an email and I will keep everybody up to date and notified whether or not we're going to have the second part, which should have been last week, next week. If you guys think of something else, let me know. These questions that we could not answer, I have notes. I will get those answers looked up and email the group those responses. Anything else? Okay, looks like we're good. Thank you everybody for joining us and hopefully we'll see you guys next week.